You are my shepherd, I shall not want. You make me to lie down in green pastures. You lead me beside the still waters. You restore my soul. You lead me in the paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup runneth over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Will you please join me in this morning's responsive call to worship? The Lord made a promise to Abraham, I will make you a great nation, more numerous than the stars. The prophets remind us of all God has promised. I will remove from your heart and give you a heart of flesh. I will write my law in their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Jesus said, I come not to call the saints, but the sinners. We are promised reconciliation and salvation through Christ's blood. Bound together and gathered to bless and to be blessed, let us together sing praise to God.
I'm a little nervous. <clears throat> but anyways, good morning. Good morning. Um, we are all so blessed to have Norfield, and we want the church not to just get by, but to thrive. So as I thought about Norfield and giving and why we give, I just kept coming back to a speech I'd heard a while ago, which was given by one of America's great orators. So with massive apologies to Paul Harvey, here goes. And on the eighth day, God looked down on his planned paradise and said, I need a caretaker, so God made a Norfield deacon. God said, I need somebody willing to get up before dawn, write a sermon, work all day visiting the sick, rewrite the sermon, eat coffee hour leftovers for supper, and go back and stay past 10 p.m. for council meetings, so God made a Norfield pastor. God, fed, God said, I need somebody bold enough with a voice to claim Jenny Mitchell's Christmas ornament for the third time, <laughs> yet gentle enough to welcome a shy family on their first visit, someone audacious enough to organize men's march madness, yet humble enough to put out silverware, wash dishes, arrange flowers, and then tell Guy Boss, I'd love to coordinate coffee hour and mean it. So God made Norfield Fellowship. God said, I need somebody willing to sit up all night with a new refugee family and watch them struggle with language and housing and then dry her eyes and say, it's going to get better. I need someone who can fashion the Lido deck or a tiki bar out of the plain Farish hall, who will finish their giving day activities and then aching from painting a garage or pulling weeds, who will put in four more joyful hours at the clasp dance. So God made Norfield outreach. God said, I need somebody who can shape a budget from the collection plate, fix the roof, or pull down the barn. Who can make 4% on the endowment instead of three, manage stewardship, liaise with the nursery, provide legal counsel, negotiate insurance contracts, and for the times the congregation needs comfort most, tend the memorial garden. So God made a Norfield trustee. God said, I need someone forceful enough to be heard over Sammy and Simon, Emma, Grant, and Quinn, yet astute enough to hear their gems during children's sermon, to pass out faith rocks and blow a kazoo, attend Bible study, prepare lessons for discovery hour, and stop amid the chaos to soothe the hurt feelings of a four-year-old. So God made Northfield Christian Ed. And God had to have somebody willing to practice singing at double speed, to get the harmonies down and the bell parts learned ahead of the 10 a.m. service, with patience to corral a dozen rambunctious little music makers to demonstrate a triangle, a bongo, or a bell, with enough energy to last until the pizza arrives. <laughs> so God made Norfield music. And God had to have somebody who would think deep and talk straight and not cut corners, somebody to seed, weed, and feed a fellow man's soul to plow and plant God's work, and to finish a hard week's work with the drive to church. Somebody who would bail a family, a community together with the soft, strong bonds of sharing, who would laugh and then sigh and then reply with smiling eyes. Wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. So God made a Northfielder. Will you please join me as we enter a time in prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of this day and for the privilege of being able to worship together in your presence. As we pray together, help us quiet our hearts and minds that we may be open to receiving your grace and your direction. Give us the gift of understanding of your will for us, for our lives. God, let us take a moment to be thankful for all that we have. While none of us is without challenges, help us remember how fortunate we are. We give you thanks for family, for friends, for jobs, for our education, for the roofs over our heads, for food, for clean water, and most of all, for your love and grace. Help us remember our blessings each day and be grateful to you for all that we have and not dwell on what we don't have. Dear Lord, we pray for our pastors, Bernard and Kelly. Bless them with travel mercies. We thank you for their spiritual leadership and ask that you continue to give them the wisdom and strength to lead, 
to lead us to you. We ask for blessings for Norfield staff, lay leaders, and volunteers. Please guide them to further your mission for our congregation. We pray for our sister congregations, Emmanuel, St. Francis, Temple Israel. Along with Norfield, help them serve your people and spread the good news in Weston and beyond. God, as a congregation, we come to you with heavy hearts and troubled minds as a result of recent losses. We pray today for our seminarian intern, Ellen Willard, her husband, Dimitri, on the loss of Dimitri's father, Richard Frank. Be with their two children, Stephen and James, who are grieving the loss of their beloved grandfather. Be with our community and congregation as we mourn the loss of our beloved Shirley Snyder, like her husband, Fred. Shirley was tireless in her love and support for Norfield and Weston. Be with their family and friends as they grieve the loss of this iconic lady, especially as it comes so close to after Fred's passing. We continue to pray for the McWilliams family as they rebuild their lives after the loss of Wendy DeMoshe. Father, like the Israelites who struggled to believe in you when they could not see or hear you, and who grew impatient waiting for you, we sometimes wonder where you are in these tough and testing times. God, we pray for those impacted by horrific violence especially the victims of the Las Vegas massacre. Help us as a people to find solutions that will prevent the recurrence of, of these all too frequent events. God, we pray for those impacted by recent hurricanes, especially those in Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, and the rest of the Caribbean. We pray for those impacted by earthquakes in Mexico. We pray for those impacted by this year's wildfires in the American West, particularly the current fires in California. Be with first responders, caregivers, and all those who put their lives ahead of others. In all these situations, God, help us to embrace your teaching and put helping others and meeting critical needs ahead of personal, philosophical, religious, and political differences. Help our elected leaders and government officials to be effective in relieving suffering and rebuilding lives in the most expedient ways possible. Heavenly Father, the fear of nuclear conflict has risen once again on two fronts. Lord, we pray for peace. We pray for understanding. We pray for reconciliation. May our children, their children, and those after them never have to face these fears again. Father, every day on a national and global level, we witness discord and political aims being placed before the welfare of your people. Be with the world and national leaders. Help them to find a path towards balance and productivity that serves your will, not theirs. We pray too for our state and local leaders, help them to find solutions to our economic crisis, challenges providing education for our children, drug epidemics, and other social issues. God, strengthen our faith in you. As you commanded the Israelites, may we play, place no God before you. Guide us to be your servants and help those in need. Help us to console one another. Help us to seek compromise in a world of acrimony and divisiveness. And now, as Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power and the glory forever. Amen. Now invite the children up for this morning's children's sermon.
please join me in reading Psalm 106, verses 1 to 6 and 19 to 23. Praise the Lord. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Who can utter the mighty doings of the Lord or declare all his praise? Happy are those who observe justice, who do righteousness at all times. Remember me, O Lord, when you show favor to your people. Help me when you deliver them, that I may see the prosperity of your chosen ones, that I may rejoice in the gladness of your nation, that I may glory in your heritage. Both we and our ancestors have sinned, we have committed iniquity, have done wickedly. They made a calf at Horeb and worshipped a calf's image. They exchanged the glory of God for the image of an ox that eats grass. They forgot God, their Savior, who had done great things in Egypt, wondrous works in the land of Ham, and awesome deeds by the Red Sea. Therefore, he said he would destroy them, had not Moses, his chosen one, stood in the breach before him to turn away his wrath from destroying them. Today's second reading is from the second book of the Old Testament. We are reading from Exodus chapter 32, verses 1 through 14, and chapter 20, verses 1 through 4. Exodus tells one of the most foundational stories in the Bible. A simplified way to summarize the story is via three pivotal events. The Israelites' exodus from Egypt to the Sinai wilderness, establishing a covenant between God and Israel, and the testing and renewal of that covenant. This third moment is the subject of today's reading. Moses has been on Mount Sinai speaking with God for 40 days and 40 nights. The people of Israel are waiting in the wilderness at the base of the mountain and have grown impatient. Hear now our reading. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make gods for us, who shall go before us. As for this Moses, this man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Take off the gold rings that are on your, the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from them, formed it in a mold, and cast an image of a calf. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made, a proclama made proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a festival of the Lord. They rose early the next day, offered burnt offerings, and brought sacrifices of well-being. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to revel. The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once. Your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside the way that I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf, and they have worshipped it and sacrificed to it, and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this, this people, how stiff-necked they are. Now let me alone, so my, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them. And of you I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord his God, and said, O oh Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why would the Egyptians say it was the, with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath, change your mind, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, how you swore to them by your own self, saying to them, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven, and all of this land that I have promised I will give you to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. 
And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster he planned to bring on his people. And now from chapter 20. God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Here ends the reading. Good morning. Good morning. It is a blessing and privilege to stand in this pulpit again. Thank you, Dan, for again doing the heavy lifting. And his summary of Exodus is basically what I'm going to talk about this morning. So we could probably call it a day. Um, thank you, Bell Choir and, and uh, Choir. When I preach on Sunday, there's not so much action here, but this is great. Anyway, I regret that I wasn't here last Sunday to hear David preach. Um, we attended, actually, a terrific wedding out of town, and um, so we were not able to be here. But David inspires us all by music ministry, by his words from here. And he was able to share with me uh, some of his thoughts, and I would like to try to continue um, with his ideas, his thoughts, the themes, and um, try to end up in a similar place. As a community, we at Northfield are fortunate because no matter who is preaching here, one gospel is being proclaimed. There are variations on a theme, but we all begin with God's love for us. And then we all preach that our faith in action leads us to love one another. Of course, the devil is in the details, how we express that love. And we are all works in process. Will you pray with me? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Amen. This morning's lesson, as you have heard, comes from Exodus, the second book of Torah, or the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses. Now, I'm going to say something outrageous here, or at least controversial. Exodus is the most important book in the Bible. But now let me immediately amend the statement. Because many of us here call ourselves Christians, and Jesus is not mentioned in Exodus, I will say that Exodus is the most important book of the Hebrew Bible. Now, let that thought sink in for a bit while I continue my sermon. As I said, Exodus is the second book of Torah. The Hebrew word Torah is often understood and translated as law. Jesus often refers to the law, Torah, and the prophets. But Torah also means instruction. And these five books are the basis of Jewish teaching, culture, and religious practice. It is instruction about how to live. In July, when I preached on a text from Genesis, I told you about the sources, first oral and then written, of Torah. It is a complex issue. Scholars, and I cautiously include myself in this category, do not believe that Moses wrote the whole Torah by himself. And the stories and traditions that are found in Torah come from a great span of time. The age of the patriarchs, Abraham, those guys, is roughly the first half of the second millennium BC, some 4,000 years ago. The time of the exodus from Egypt, if it happens, maybe took place during the reign of Ramesses II, maybe 3,200 years ago. The writing down of Torah probably began during the Babylonian captivity, about 600 BC, and it took maybe 200 years to complete the Old Testament's composition and editing. Compare that time span to the approximately 50 years it took the New Testament 
to be written in the second half of the first century AD. To greatly simplify this discussion, and I think it's important for you to know this, there are four different traditions or sources in Torah. Scholars denote these traditions by the letters J, E, D, and P. D refers to the material that's in Deuteronomy. P is related to the cultic or priestly material that is distinctive in Torah. And it's not easy to distinguish and separate this stuff out, but scholars since the 16th century have been working on this. It is a little bit easier to recognize the J and E material. In the E tradition, God is called Elohim, which is translated as God. Elohim is also used as a generic term for God or gods in the Bible. In the J tradition, God is called Yahweh. In German, Yahweh is spelt with a J. Yahweh is the Hebrew name which in English Bibles is translated as Lord in small capitals. It is Yahweh whom we are addressing when we pray, hallowed be thy name. Now, why should you care about the sources of Torah? You don't. <laughs> but knowing that there are different sources will help you understand why there are throughout the Pentateuch contradictory and conflicting stories of the same events and different names for the same places and all sorts of confusion. If you paid attention to the psalm reading, you'd say that Moses got the commandments at Horeb, but almost every place else in the Bible, they talk about Mount Sinai, and I'm going to talk about Mount Sinai, but they're the same places, the two different sources. Anyway, if you have, and I'll say this again, if you have a moment sometime, compare the two creation stories in Genesis. There are two different stories from two different traditions, and they aren't the same thing. I mean, look at that sometime. Anyway, I understand if you're not interested in this sort of thing, but you have to remember I was a classroom teacher, so that's what you get. Now, now back to the lesson from Exodus. I did say a few minutes ago, the Exodus from Egypt, if it happened. Let me say clearly that regarding the account of the liberation of Israel from Egypt by the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the subsequent wandering of Israel in the desert, essentially the whole book of Exodus, there is no contemporary evidence of any such events happening. And the Egyptians kept good records and histories. The Bible is all we have. It is impossible to discern what historical events lie behind the book of Exodus. But I will say that something probably happened. Jews and Christians and Muslims believe that Moses, that with Moses, God acted in history. Yahweh led or allowed a group of slaves to escape from Egypt. A passage from Deuteronomy may be the oldest confession or statement of faith in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 6. We were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, but Yahweh brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Yahweh displayed before our eyes great and awesome signs and wonders against Egypt, against Pharaoh and all his household. He brought us up out from there in order to bring us in, to give us the land that he promised on oath to our ancestors. The exodus of Israel from Egypt is what Jews and Christians believe to be the first of Yahweh's great interventions in human history. A few years ago, I introduced to you a theological term, Heilsgeschichte, or salvation history. We can interpret history in terms of what we believe to be God's actions. For Christians, the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ as Yahweh's redemptive act is the paramount event of salvation history. So the book of Exodus is a testimony of Yahweh acting in history. We might say that chapters 1 to 15 
including Moses' confrontation with Pharaoh, the plagues, the Passover, and the parting of the Reed Sea and the rest, are the story of freedom from. And chapters 16 to 40 tell the story of freedom to. Liberation from slavery is followed by liberation to accomplish a new thing, to establish a new kingdom. Now, I could stop my sermon right here and just say that next Easter and Passover time, there will be a showing on television of the movie The Ten Commandments, the biblical epic movie produced and directed by Cecil B. DeMille. And you can just watch the story of the Exodus. This 1956 movie was the most expensive movie made to that time. Charlton Heston and Yul Brynner were the stars, Moses and Ramesses, respectively. And when I was thinking about this, some of you probably don't know who Charlton Heston and Yul Brynner were. <laughs> but they were big stars back in the day. Anyway, the movie won an Academy Award for special effects. The visuals are pretty tame compared to today's movies. But remember, this movie was made over 60 years ago. So if you plan to watch or rewatch this movie, you can now doze off and skip the rest of the sermon. <laughs> and for those of you who are still with me, I will continue. The pivotal event in Exodus is Yahweh's second appearance on Mount Sinai. Moses goes up to the mountain and Yahweh says to him, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the Israelites, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. Then the Ten Commandments are given, and a long collection of law and regulations. This latter collection of legislation is called by scholars the Covenant Collection. It begins and ends with directives about ritual and religious practices. In the middle, there are discussions of treatment of slaves and guidelines about property. Moses reports to the people what Yahweh has laid out. And the people promise, saying, all the words that Yahweh has spoken, we will do. They promise. Then Yahweh invites Moses back up to the mountain, where Moses stays in the presence of Yahweh for 40 days and 40 nights. Moses is going to receive the commandments carved on tablets of stone. He departs from the Israelites and leaves his brother Aaron in charge. Now, at this point in the book of Exodus, there was an interpolation of materials about the building of a tabernacle, that is a portable shrine, and the ark, a portable wooden chest. The ark is both a container for the covenant documents and a footstool on which God is invisibly enthroned. The ark is used to guide Israel in the wilderness, to lead Israel in war, and to be a medium for oracles. For you movie buffs, there's a pretty good representation of the Ark in the Steven Spielberg movie, Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> then there is a section on priestly garments and vestments. This stole I'm wearing has its origin in this part of the Bible. Brother Jim Carter. And then there are instructions for the ordination of priests guidelines for the furnishings of the temples and other odds and ends. It is possible that it took 40 days for Moses to write all this stuff down, but it's more probable that the 40 days and nights are a symbolic period of time, and this material about sacred regulations and practices is an addition of priestly material into the Sinai narrative. Remember I told you about the P source of the Pentateuch. This is the P stuff. 
Now, let me summarize what has happened to this point in the book of Exodus. Yahweh, with Moses as his agent, has beat up on Pharaoh, and the Israelites are liberated from Egypt. They cross the Reed Sea, and the Egyptians are stuck in the mud. The Hebrews roam about the desert, and Yahweh provides them with food and water. They arrive at Mount Sinai, and Yahweh appears and makes a deal with the Israelites. Yahweh has chosen the Israelites to be his people, and if they do what Yahweh commands, Yahweh will give them a land of their own, and they will prosper. In the desert, Yahweh and Israel made a covenant. A word about covenants. A dictionary definition of covenant says it is usually a formal, solemn, and binding agreement. It can be a written agreement or promise, usually under seal, between two or more parties, especially for the performance of some action. Yahweh made a covenant with Abraham. Yahweh promised to Abraham a gigantic family, a special relationship to God, and the land of Canaan. Now here in the desert, there is a similar covenant. The Israelites have agreed, they have promised to follow the Lord's ordinances and commandments, and in exchange, they will prosper in the promised land. But, there's always a but. But what happens when Moses is on the mountain communing with Yahweh? The people down below get impatient. They forget everything about what they agreed to. This morning's text, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, come, make gods for us who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. The Israelites forgot about their God and their leader. They proceeded to make an idol in the image of a calf made from the gold jewelry of the people. They conveniently forgot about the newly issued commandments about not having any other gods and about making idols. I will note only that their choice about golden calf was not an illogical choice. A calf or a young bull was a common idol in the ancient Near East, symbolizing strength and fertility. Nonetheless, it was a bad decision, and Yahweh was not pleased. Yahweh said to Moses, Go down at once. Your people, whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt, have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way that I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it. And said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Note the implicit criticism of Moses when Yahweh says to Moses, your people. All I can say is that Israel as a people At their very first opportunity, they break the covenant with Yahweh. Is that just human nature? To break agreements? To blow off promises? Now, I'll just remind you about what happens next. Moses successfully intercedes with Yahweh, and Yahweh changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring on his people. And the story continues. Years of wandering in the desert, and then entrance into the land of Canaan. Battles are fought with the native peoples. Eventually, a monarch is established under David. But it's a bumpy road. Israel regularly forgets about the covenant with Yahweh, and Israel often doesn't follow Yahweh's commandments. Israel is sometimes punished very severely. And then, centuries later, 
because of Israel's turning away from Yahweh and breaking the covenant, Israel ceases to exist. Israel goes into exile in Babylon. The prophets have a lot to say about the breaking of Yahweh's covenant and how Israel is being punished. This is essentially what the Old Testament is about. So why should you care? How is Israel breaking its covenant with Yahweh and being punished relevant to us today? In a certain sense, we are Israel. We who are followers of Jesus are a continuation of Israel or the chosen people. It begins with Jesus being an Israelite, a special one to be sure from our point of view. Jesus had a special relationship with Yahweh. For those of us who believe that Jesus was or is special, Jesus' teachings are analogous to the ordinances and commandments that Israel received at Sinai. A couple of weeks ago, as we customarily do on the first Sunday of the month, we celebrated Holy Communion. Remember the words of institution of the Lord's Supper. Jesus said, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Jesus made a covenant with his disciples. And when we partake of the bread and the wine, we make a covenant with Jesus. What is our covenant with Jesus and with Yahweh, Jesus' Father? It probably doesn't mean following each of the 613 commandments that Orthodox Jews believe are in Torah. But our covenant with Jesus probably involves following his teachings. The Gospels contain many authentic teachings of Jesus. And I believe if we follow these teachings, we will have a new life. Which of Jesus' teachings do we follow? Or are some more important than others? I think Jesus himself gave us guidance. A lawyer asked Jesus a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment of the law is the greatest? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all of Torah and the prophets. Love God and love your neighbor. Pretty easy to do, right? We can keep this covenant. It is easy for us to make fun of the Israelites in the movie The Ten Commandments. There they are in slightly risque costumes dancing around the golden calf. There is evidence of alcohol abuse and debauchery. But we're not like them. We won't break our covenant with Jesus. We don't have any golden calves. Or do we? What about the golden calf of getting your kid into Harvard? Or what about the satisfaction of owning a nice house in Weston? Or acquiring a really impressive toy, like a Porsche 911 Carrera Cabriolet? Or the prestige of being a member of an exclusive social club? Or working like crazy to get a partnership in a name law firm? or getting a promotion to the corner office, although I'm not sure if there are corner offices anymore, or supporting our elected officials, even when we know they are wrong, or trying to preach a perfect sermon. Do we not sometimes worship these golden calves? On the other hand, 
This congregation, I think, is exemplary about the commandment of loving neighbors and keeping true to this part of the covenant. Our recently held annual day of giving was all about loving neighbors. A range of activities demonstrated our faith in action. Helping out at the Bridgeport Rescue Mission, a handful of projects in support of the Connecticut Institute for Refugees and Immigrants, including preparing meals for immigrant families. There were home repair projects at Pivot Ministries and some residences in Weston. And there was that great project at Lachat Farm. And finally, everybody got to return to the parish hall to dance with our friends from class. Thank you, Outreach Ministry team, for organizing us, for leading us, and for encouraging us to actively love our neighbors. Of course, there is more to be done, individually and collectively. What is special about the Day of Giving is that we are working together and loving our neighbors together. We are stronger and more effective together. And our work together is an affirmation that we are a community. What David talked about last week, belonging to each other. I began this morning with the covenant that Yahweh made with the patriarchs, then with Moses and the Israelites. Yes, sometimes the Israelites were unfaithful and turned away from the covenant. But Yahweh's steadfast love continued, and Israel usually returned to Yahweh and the covenant. Then I talked a little about our covenant with Jesus and how it is important to follow his teachings, because if we do, Jesus has promised us a new life. Jesus said, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Now I'd like to touch upon a third covenant, the covenant of Northfield Congregational Church. We read and affirm this covenant every year at the annual meeting. The covenant begins, we promise to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And we take as our rule of life the words, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Now I'd like you all to recite the next words of the Northfield Covenant, repeating after me. We take this church to be our church. We take this church to be our church. And ever mindful of our fellow members, and ever mindful of our fellow members, we promise to walk with them. We promise to walk with them in faithfulness and Christian love. In faithfulness and Christian love. I believe that together we can be a force for good in this world. I believe that together we can help bring about God's kingdom. We take this church to be our church and ever mindful of our fellow members, we promise to walk with them in faithfulness and Christian love. Amen.